Thank you very much for the introduction. So as Martin said, what I'm going to do is talk about how we go about decarbonising aviation. And I, I, put the, I put the word help in because clearly we can't do this on our own. We're going to have to work with our partners in industry. Um, by we, I mean the Oxford Thermal Fluids Institute. And those of you that have uh, visited what uh, used to be the OC lab, but uh, is now the Oxford Thermal Fluids Institute, will know that it's uh, quite a large building stroke test facility to the west of Oxford uh, on, uh, uh, on the, uh, to, to, well, to the west of Oxford. Um, the lab was opened in about 2010 by the Vice, Vice Chancellor and since that time we've become increasingly busy. We've extended the floor area by about 10 percent and uh, currently we're working on extending it again by more than another 20 percent so we're filling it full of uh, interesting test facilities so that we can do research uh, simply in aerospace so the research group includes uh, experts in computational fluid dynamics hypersonics heat transfer experimentation and modeling and also instrumentation I should acknowledge the help that I've had from all of the academic staff at, at the OTI, but it's specifically David, Alex, John, Marco, Ed, Luca, Rob, Simon, and Frank, the last two being busy profs who are uh, uh, industry leaders. Simon's at the Aerospace Technology Institute, and Frank is at Air Airbus. <clears throat> okay, so over the, what, what, What's going to happen over the next two or so decades is we're going to replace the turbofans that you see when you look out uh, of your window of your of the aeroplane that you will fly from Heathrow, uh, which is almost always a turbofan. That is currently burning your fossil fuel. So that will be replaced over the next two decades or so, or so by alternative systems. So the aircraft propulsion solutions for zero carbon uh, need new ways of storing energy and new methods of propulsion. Um, <clears throat> what I hope I'll show is that technologies that, uh, that we need don't even exist and will need to be invented. And that will lead to lots of research and lots of development. And the case I'm going to make is that Oxford is well placed to help. So on the right, I've got some of the things that once we started looking at this about two years ago, as the pandemic started, we looked at all the different things that would be required in terms of components and systems. And there's a, a considerable amount of research that we now need to engage in. The, the block in the middle is specifically the systems that we have experience in at the Oxford Thermal Fluids Institute. Institute. So the aim is to try and the aim of this talk is to get across why this is really important, what are the solutions that have been considered, why it's so difficult, and what the engineering challenges are, and how we could go about helping in Oxford. So this slide is courtesy of the Aerospace Technology Institute, and it shows uh, it shows the bubbles. The maroon bubbles are solutions that are related to existing jet engines. So they're called ultra efficient platforms. So the propulsion system is linked to the turbofans that we've seen, but with enhanced technologies to reduce fuel burn. Um, the information in the chart shows that aircraft engines and aircraft themselves tend to be replaced at around about 10 year intervals. So this is ATI's projection of what's going to happen to replace when uh, in terms of the need to replace regional jets, narrow bodies, wide bodies uh, over the years. And you can see that uh, we've got maybe until 2028 until the regional jets need to be replaced. So the bottom axis is aircraft entering to service and you can see that we're going to be starting with these ultra efficient platforms uh, with the lower range regional 80 to 150 passengers, uh, relatively low, low range systems. The, the total market is absolutely enormous and uh, aerospace and air, 
in particular aircraft propulsion is something the UK is particularly good at. So we will expect, and this is an ATI projection, that we could be getting up to 18% of that market. But the lower bubbles are the zero carbon emission platform. So these are the ones I'm going to be talking about specifically today where uh, there is no CO2 emissions. Um, this is, again, a projection from the ATI, and it shows how difficult it's going to be to get uh, the global aviation emissions, which is the axis on the left-hand side, uh, in megatons per year. And you can see the pandemic, uh, these are, these are year ends. And then you can see that if we don't do anything about the technology that we use in our aircraft engines, then uh, the emissions will continue to rise. Um, the information in the chart is the fact that as the ATI uh, funds research and Oxford and other universities and the engine and aerospace companies work to introduce these new solutions, we can start driving down the increase in CO2 emissions. So the key is, uh, the key shows the different sizes of aircraft being, being replaced. So the, reg the regional aircraft is RA, UE means uh, ultra efficient. We can see that as soon as that fleet is introduced, if everything goes right, then the rate of incentive, the, grade, the gradient starts to reduce. Narrow body, the first zero carbon uh, solution is the regional aircraft appearing hopefully in 2036. So you can see that eventually we start to drive down the carbon dioxide emissions. Um, this big blue, sorry, this big gray, gray section is the reduction of fuel by other means. And they start, that starts with the uh, carbon offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation, which is expected to be introduced in uh, before the end of the decade. So that's when the airlines and when we, when we start to travel, we start to actually deliberately offset the amount of carbon dioxide. And you can see that, that will have an, an enormous effect on it too. So everything looks possible, but it's going to need a lot of steps. Um, all of you know, everybody knows that the emissions from the tailpipe of, of a jet engine, if it's burning hydrocarbons, are mostly carbon dioxide. But in, in addition to the carbon dioxide, there'll be water, uh, NOx emissions, sulfur dioxide emissions, depending on the fuel, carbon dioxide, under hydrocarbons and soot. And the assessment that was done under the Clean Spot Sky Programme reported two years ago uh, collated the, the the global warming potential, which was a metric of how each of these emissions uh, compares to uh, the emissions from kerosene itself. So if you look at the table, kerosene is running at 100% uh, in terms of the global warming potential. Uh, so it's the datum for carbon dioxide, NOx, water vapor, contrails. And the significant thing to see is that if we the significant point is that if we just go for sin fuel, then um, we can certainly consider the potential of getting rid of carbon dioxide, but we won't do anything about NOx and we won't change the water vapour and we will have to be judicious in the amount of contrails that we can, do, we can reduce through improvements in technology. But if we could fuel with hydrogen, then clearly we could get rid of carbon dioxide. If we can... If we burn hydrogen in the combustor, then we still produce some NOx. We will produce extra water vapour, uh, and with extra technology, we could work, work on reducing the contrails. If the hydrogen is used in fuel cells, then things get much better because the whole process happens at low temperature and the NOx uh, doesn't occur. So the target is to drive down these emissions. The current state of the art in turbofans is this thing in front of it. So it's a Rolls-Royce Trent XWB. Uh, it's badged as the most efficient engine in the world. You can see how it works by drawing in the air from the left, and it passes much more air around the core than it takes through the core. Um, it is it's exploiting the, the two features that we can, uh, the two levers that we can twiddle or turn 
in terms of reducing fuel efficiency from a jet engine. So this graph here is a carpet map that's showing specific fuel consumption uh, against, it's plotted on the map against propulsive efficiency uh, and thermal efficiency. So the grid tell, tells us where, where a particular engine or technology is. So current engines are in this ratio. They have propulsion efficiencies that are in this band and they work with thermal efficiencies that are in this range. And so what we want to do for the ultra efficient engines is drive the fuel burn right down into that corner where we've got the, uh, the theoretical limits. And so we do that by increasing the pro propulsion efficiency. And in general terms, that means making the bypass bigger and bigger. So the Trent 1000 will be replaced by uh, an ultra fan series of engines, which have got an enormous bypass. And then eventually ultra open rotor technology will maximize the propulsive efficiency for this class of ultra efficient engine. The thermal efficiency, there are different ways we can increase the thermal efficiency. One is by actually just burning the gas hotter and hotter. So the second law of thermodynamics still helps. And we're quite a way off the uh, adiabatic limit. But there are other things we can do to try and improve the efficiency. The increment, well, I say increment, but it's quite a big step. And this is the ultra fan solution that Rolls-Royce uh, is uh, has designed and has operated. Uh, it has an enormous bypass, so it's maximised its bypass, and it has integrated into it a gearbox to enable the size of the turbofan to be minimised, the sorry, the turbine to be minimised to enable a very large uh, fan to be fitted. Other ways to improve the, the cycle efficiency are to do what we can to recover heat. And if we look, draw an analogy to gas turbines that are used in power generation, this uh, picture to the right is, the, is what the internet tells me is the most efficient gas turbine. So it's a combined cycle. And those of you that can remember thermodynamics uh, will know that the problem with gas turbine is the exhaust gas temperature is relatively hot. So if we think about the dual cycle temperature entropy, then the exhaust gas temperature is uh, being sent out at a temperature that still has some useful heat in it. And so that what they do in land-based gas turbines is they include an additional cycle, a ranking cycle, that uses that heat to uh, fire a steam turbine. But the problem with that, of course, is it's, uh, it's very heavy and it's very large. And so when, uh, when we, talk, we try, and this is an engine called the WR21, the Rolls-Royce has included, uh, has uh, provided the Royal Navy for the Type 45 destroyer. You can see that actually the heat exchangers can start to dwarf the size of the core. So here's, here's the gas turbine here. There's the power turbine. All of this is the recuperator, and uh, there is an inter there's an intercooler that pre-cools the air before it goes into the combustor. So that's a sort of ultimate heat recovery system, but it needs to be fitted in something like a ship uh, to be able to cope with those sorts of sizes. And those of you that have been to York will be familiar uh, with the, 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 the problems associated with uh, external combustion. So here's a locomotive that's cut away. It's, it's, it's a really great example of showing uh, why sometimes you, it pays you not to include a heat exchanger unless you really need it. So the locomotive you can see is cut away here and it's showing that most of the bulk of the, 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 the locomotive is just the, the shell and tube heat exchanger that's fitted uh, to recover the heat. So that being said, we want to maximize our efficiency and so there's some great work that David Gillespie did with his student uh, Kenny uh, quite a few years ago so this is very much ahead of its time and what they looked at was how the heat exchanger could be integrated into the actual core of the engine itself and so there's a there's a design David worked obviously with Rolls-Royce uh, pro program partners in Europe the program was called NEWAC uh, what's happening here is the compressed gas is going on the core and it's been sent into a, a very compact heat exchanger, and that's where the research and development has to happen. And then it's going back into the core and being carry on being compressed, and it goes to the burner, etc. 
So you really have to work hard to make sure that these heat exchanges are as compact as possible. And what David did was he used uh, primary surface heat exchangers, uh, complex manufacture, AM additive manufacture, uh, sophisticated, I think, nickel alloys. And he and his students showed that you could get some realistic geometries that would work in a very compact uh, environment with metrics like significant reductions in pressure loss. Um, if we start to move away from kerosene, then it's helpful to think about what we're trying to achieve. And what aircraft do is they take passengers and freight certain distances. So this is the Breda equation, which shows the range uh, of an aircraft uh, as a function of the lift to drag ratio. Um, a log that depends on the mass of fuel and the takeoff mass, and that's something that uh, is a, a reasonably big factor when we burn something like 30% of the total mass of 787 is fuel. So this is quite a big factor. Uh, and then what that is in terms of energy storage is the specific enthalpy of the fuel divided by the gravitational acceleration and then multiplied by the, uh, the efficiency of the propulsion and engine system. And the problem we've got is that if we draw the analysis equation for a battery system, uh, uh, then you can see almost directly the same equation. This time we've got the specific energy of the battery. We don't use much mass now as the battery is just discharging. So we haven't got this log term. Uh, lift, lift to drag ratio is a function, function of the airframe. But the real problem is that the specific mass or uh, the specific enthalpy of the fuel uh, for a hydrocarbon is 45 megajoules per kilogram. Uh, is pitched against something like 0.7 megajoules per kilogram for a state-of-the-art battery. And so you've got almost two orders of magnitude problem when you replace kerosene with uh, a battery. And this, this chart here shows a uh, collection, again, courtesy of the ATI, showing uh, gravimetric energy density. So if you look at the units, kilowatts, kilowatt hours per kilogram. Uh, here we've got... Uh, hydrocarbons which are obviously ranking really well uh, we've got batteries that are again sort of something like two orders of magnitude lower in terms of energy density and of course that has serious implications for the range the, the other actions is energy density expressed as kilowatt hours per cubic meter in, in terms of moving towards alternatives to fossil fuels it's already started um, so Rolls-Royce has demonstrated a two and a half megawatt generator, which is basically a connection between a turbo, an existing engine, an A2100, connected to an aerospace uh, designed uh, generator. So that's available for hybrid applications where we deal with the fact that we're not unlikely to move directly towards batteries because the battery technology isn't ready yet. And so thinking about uh, hybrid solutions makes a lot of sense. Airbus has moved even further and is, uh, is working on the, has an actual zero E flying test bed demonstrator. And so if you look carefully at this A380, it has an extra engine on it. And that engine is gonna be powered by, it's gonna be fueled by liquid hydrogen. And so there'll be liquid hydrogen in, within, uh, within the airframe itself. Uh, they've rolled the demonstrator out, but uh, we'll, be, and we'll be flying it in the foreseeable future. <clears throat> there are other demonstrators out there. But there are, um, there's a spin-out company from DLR that's flying uh, two-seater uh, fuel cell-powered aircrafts. Uh, which you can see the sort of complexity of the engine there, but that's all powered by fuel cells. And then Zero Avia uh, made, made a lot of progress in uh, short range and short flights with, a, with their fuel cell powered um, uh, to, to prop, prop aircraft. And then further down the line, there will be solutions where um, the actual propulsive efficiency is maximised by a series of a combination of electric motors. So this is a concept from T Delft. The, the roadmap coming from Clean Sky 2, which is the report from the uh, a consortium funded by the European uh, Commission, showed that the expectation 
over this period will be that commuters and regional jets and short range will probably be fuel cells, uh, whereas medium range and long range aircraft will be hydrogen powered gas turbines. That sort of uh, trajectory is confirmed by uh, a recent programme at the Aerospace Technology Institute, so, so that's a UK funded government funded agency. And they looked at all the alternatives for different energy stores for um, for future flight for zero carbon flight. And here they've highlighted with it using a traffic light system what, what the problems are. So we look at batteries, we can see that the actual fuel volume and the fuel propulsion system mass uh, is something of a concern. Uh, fuel cell, liquid hydrogen fuel cells, liquid hydrogen combustion, gaseous hydrogen, all come with particular uh, challenges and particular advantages. But in, in terms of uh, the, the, the energy store of choice, it looks like liquid hydrogen is starting to rank as the most promising um, energy store. I'll talk very briefly about fuel cells uh, and from a thermal point of view, meaning an Oxford Thermofluids Institute point of view, the, the, the challenges that are associated with fuel cells is that they generate quite a lot of heat. They haven't got the same continuous flow of air through them that we've seen in turbofans, but very significantly, they need to operate at relatively low temperatures, which means that for every kilowatt that's dissipated, um, the surface area of whatever heat exchange is required has to be pretty big to deal with that heat. And that's because they're operating or seek to operate at something like 80 degrees C. And so the delta T is small. And so the area has to be pretty big. We've, uh, uh, at, the, at the Oxford Thermal Fluids Institute, we've done lots and lots of work on heat exchanges over the year. Uh, we do computer models, we do simulations, we build experiments. So these, these are uh, some liquid crystal experiments that we did a few years ago. Uh, these are tests of real things. And so we have a lot of experience in optimising heat exchanges and uh, understanding the physics that dictates their performance. And so here's, a, here's the, the, the sort of heat exchanger that was in the new app programme. It's something called the primary surface heat exchanger which is basically sheets that are separated by the ridges. And so some very detailed work in a PhD here looking at the uh, distributions of heat transfer coefficients, computational simulation compared to the heat transfer, uh, the, heat, uh, the results from a, from a liquid crystal experiment. And the ongoing work we've now got in uh, heat exchanges includes a study of plate feet and thin heat exchanges into the bypass of uh, a turbofan design traits for different classes of heat exchangers and the design of very significant test facilities, of which I'll show uh, a slide, which is the Goliath facility. So we, we procured this very large 53 kilograms a second. It takes about a megawatt to power it. And this will be able to test uh, ex heat exchangers at full scale in conditions representative of a turbofan bypass. So here's some work that John Dr. John Cooley, one of our senior research fellows, did uh, designing the tunnel and making this, uh, giving it the ability to produce a Mach 0.6 flow in the region of the heat exchanger. So the heat exchanger will be fitted in this zone here. Um, I need to mention hydrogen. Uh, the use of hydrogen isn't completely new. Uh, there was some work done in the 1950s by Lockheed Martin. And they put together a concept for a reconnaissance aircraft, which uh, it was called the CL400. The, CL the engine within it was built by Pratt & Whitney, uh, the Model 304. Uh, and they did fly it, uh, but, they, but the program didn't proceed beyond the demonstration. Um, there was also a, a Soviet uh, engine as well, which, we did, which, which didn't, again, push on. We used liquid, they were using liquid hydrogen to deal with the fact that um, once you replace kerosene and energy stores, hydrocarbons that have a very high energy density, then you have to work really hard to get the energy to get the energy density up. So this is hydrogen at different pressures and different temperatures. So the isobars are plotted here 700, 100, and here's density. 
And what we're trying to do is compete with, um, if you like, on the face value of kerosene, which has a density of about 780 uh, kilograms per cubic meters. And we can't do that. But if I do some simple sums and work out what the mass of hydrogen divided by the mass of a tank using uh, simple uh, mods type uh, consider prelims type considerations of uh, the surface area of hemispheres and cylinders. And then I uh, move on a bit with my prelims uh, mechanics and relate the geometry to the stress then quite quickly I can calculate this ratio, which is mass of hydrogen to mass of tank, and come up with some distressingly low numbers. So even if we run at very low temperatures and 10 bar, then the actual problems of even using liquid hydrogen are pretty considerable. <clears throat> so here we've got temperatures, pressures, and we're seeing low efficiencies, even with carbon fiber tanks uh, operating at cryogenic temperatures. So that's that's the problem we face. We'll go back to the Pratt Whitney solution. They dealt with the fact that we've got they were using liquid hydrogen. They pressurized it. In fact what they what they did was quite interesting. They overpressurized it so the fuels come from the tank, it's been uh, pressurized by a pump, it then uh, gets heated and then it gets expanded through a bit of a turbine. So it's almost like a bottoming cycle that they've included. And then that mechanical work from that was then put into the cycle. I think this is just a concept. And then the hydrogen was then taken back into the afterburner, into the main burner. But this idea of overpressurizing is quite interesting. They had a heat exchange, a very, very interesting fine tube heat exchange that they, that they used for recuperation. And it was made of lots of small tubes uh, with, a, with curved shapes. And as shown there, and the um, <coughs> liquid hydrogen was heat was taken from the tank uh, of the Kansas aircraft. It was preheated a little bit by ram air, and then it went into the engine where it received the full force of heat from uh, that re recuperation that I've just shown. Uh, in, in addition, they've used a, they used a centrifugal pump to pressurise the liquid hydrogen uh, and. Oxford expertise, uh, one of our CFD specialists, Luca Demare, is looking at uh, the possibility of designing a liquid hydrogen uh, comp compressor for uh, similar applications now. Just going back to the problem of cryogenics, if you go, if you go to the, the handle and find out what sort of heat exchanges you should be using to deal uh, conventionally with cryogenic fuels, then you end up with some very big units. So this is the sort of process industry cryogenic heat exchanger. Uh, the, key, the, key, the key parameter that causes the problem is the uh, the surface area per, per cubic surface area per, per unit volume is relatively low. So you can see this system it's called a cold wire heat exchanger is set up to deal with enormous. Um, uh, differential expansions and contractions as the fluid gets gets cooled to uh, very low temperatures. And of course, we can't do that. Um, the other challenge is that the, hyd the hydrogen is at um, something like 28 Kelvin. And so if we get it wrong, when we take heat from the air, then we will see icing problems. And so the research challenges include the fact that we could have ice formed on the side uh, the outside of the heat exchanger that's providing the heat and if ice forms then that could cause the uh, system to block up. <clears throat> you also end up with enormous temperature differences. Hello? Okay, so, so it, near, uh, just a last couple of slides. Um, the, the trajectory of the cryogenic fluid is relatively complicated. Um, it's depending on what pressure we run at, there could be phase changes in the heat exchanger, or it could be that we operate with supercritical conditions. And there's not very much data for supercritical hydrogen being heated in the recuperator. I'll mention here an icing tunnel that David and Matt are designing as part of an EPSERT proposal and to be included in the Oxford Thermos Fluids Institute to enable us to do uh, icing studies, uh, which will, will support our work in heat exchanges. This is some work actually that's happened over the last six months or so. So it's a design of a heat exchanger for liquid hydrogen. Uh, and so 
it's, it's a cross flow heat exchanger. So it's got liquid hydrogen coming in from the left and it's got the heat source, which could be a combustion products from the gas, from the gas turbine. And uh, the cross flow heat exchanger it, here, the fluid stream, the, the, uh, the, the fluid team temperatures being uh, calculated using MATLAB in a finite volume solution. Uh, the thing to note, I think, is just the enormous temperature differences that heat exchange has got to deal with. So the combustion products are notionally 1,000 Kelvin, and we've got cryogenic fuel, fuel being sent through it at a high pressure. And so the metal temperature then is uh, completely tortured by being somewhere between a very cold place and a very hot place. Uh, and as we work through this design, we find problems of flow stability due to the fact that there are serious changes in the density. Uh, we've had to introduce anti-icing technology, uh, but we persevered and a prototype is uh, currently being designed and manufactured. Just to mention, uh, all of these uh, solutions are, uh, benefit from better power electronics and better motors, so the battery battery solution uh, with uh, motors and power electronics and so Professor Ed Walsh has been working with industrial partners on different solutions to minimise the mass of the cooling systems and he's done some very clever things uh, both in terms of modelling and characterising phase changes uh, of the heat transfer as well as minimising the mass of the uh, support and the, the insulation structures. Uh, to the benefit of these solutions going forward. So that's all I've got to say. So in terms of conclusions, uh, I've got the question that we're going to see immense changes in airframes and propulsion systems over the next two decades. The technology certainly look feasible, but there's an awful lot to do. Uh, we're in a great position at Oxford to make a, a, a global in, impact with our expertise in heat transfer. And all of these things on the right I've just listed are actually programs that we're already, we've already started. Um, and so I hope you can uh, accept that we're, uh, we stand a really good chance of uh, having the engineering department make a great contribution to zero carbon flight. Thank you very much.